hi, welcome. My name is Etienne, and I'm here to uh, tell you a bit today about how you can use VV8 to leverage the AIH, to really bring your application into the AIH. And for that, I'm gonna talk to you about why we came up with the idea of building a vector database, and I'll explain what that is, how VV8 and Docker sort of ties together, and then also talk about the journey of going from prototype to production, because it's, it's easy to start out, but production comes with all kind of, kind of different uh, challenges. Uh, but first of all, so right now everyone has AI FOMO, so everyone wants to do something related to AI. Um, but we made both the company and the product is actually quite a bit older. We started four and a half years ago, and it started with the idea of improving search. So um, first version of the slide was created when I was on a plane, happened to be a 787 uh, Dreamliner. And I thought, okay, that's a cool idea. Let's take that, that as an example. And I looked up the Wi-Fi I was actually working, so I was able to look up the Wikipedia article. And uh, what it showed is sort of this is the first paragraph, um, which uses yeah all kinds of words to basically describe a specific airplane type. And as a human being that speaks English, you can see that sort of all the keywords on the right, like aircraft, airplane, uh, the, the British spelling for, for airplane, airliner, dreamliner, they all relate to uh, that specific uh, paragraph. But for a traditional search engine, that's actually kind of hard to match. Because if you would look at sort of keyword overlap between the two lists, it would only, I think, be airliner and dreamliner that would match. But aircraft, for example, doesn't even appear in there. And then with uh, traditional search engines, you would have to do all kinds of work around. Like, for example, tell the search engine, hey, if you encounter the word aircraft, that really is the same as if you encounter the word airplane or airliner or these kind of things. And then it gets even harder with things that aren't exact matches. Like Dreamliner is one specific type of airplane, but you can't sort of replace that with the, the word airplane all the time. So this is super difficult, basically, with a, with a traditional keyword search. And then it becomes even harder if you have negation in there, for example. If it would say not an airplane, then uh, that, that becomes even more difficult to match. And the idea behind using vector embeddings is to index the meaning rather than the lexical match for, for these words. And that's, uh, for, for that, it uses high dimensional vector embeddings. And that's kind of hard to imagine. But if we just imagine a, a two dimensional vector embedding, there's an example that makes that super easy to, to understand. So when you are looking for something in a supermarket, you're kind of doing a similarity search. So in this example here, we're looking for carrots. And if you walk into the supermarket and on the one side you see like all the, the non-food stuff and on the other side you see food, then you immediately know, well, the food section is more closer to my carrots that I'm looking for, so I'm gonna go to the food section. In there, maybe then you would see like, uh, yeah, sort of packaged goods versus fresh goods. And then you go like, okay, cool, like I wanna go to the produce section. In the produce section, you see fruit and maybe vegetables, and you think like, okay, is my carrot closer to the apple or to the potato? And you say potato, and you kind of move in that direction. So that's kind of the idea of indexing by meaning, and the meaning in, in this case uh, would be sort of the, the similarity um, um, sort of in that two-dimensional space. In reality, that's a, that's a higher dimensional space. But then the whole chat GPT thing happened, and everything sort of changed even more. Um, and if you ask ChatGPT with uh, using uh, GPT 3.5 right now, does VV8 make use of Elasticsearch? It will actually say VV8 uses Elasticsearch as a storage backend. The thing is, that's wrong. So what the model did is it hallucinated. It gave this a very confident answer, and I oh, love the, the, the graphic, by the way, of the hallucinating model here on here. Um, but that's the wrong answer. So that's, that's nice and all, but it doesn't really help. Um, and what we can do in this case is, I just said, hey, try again, but I've actually copy-pasted this snippet from the VV8 documentation, uh, where it says VV8 uses a custom storage engine, blah, 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 all that good stuff. And ChatGPT sort of turns around and says, hey, I apologize for the confusion, and then at the end says, in summary, VV8 has its own custom storage engine optimized for working with vector embeddings, which is the right answer, but I did all the heavy lifting. Like, why did I use ChatGPT in the first place if I already had to look that up from the documentation and sort of copy-paste it uh, into the, the context prompt of ChatGPT. And what you can do is automate this. And then this is called retrieval augmented generation, which is basically just a fancy term for exactly what I did manually. You would use a database, a vector database, to retrieve the actual sort of source of truth for those documents. And then you would pass them automatically to the large language model. And if you do that, um, the large language model basically gives you the, the right answer as we just saw. And what's super cool about this is not only can it 
sort of overcome the, the problem of a hallucination, but also now this is stateful. Now you can change it. If you, like to, if you wanna update it, if you wanna remove something, it's just as easy as every uh, a CRUD operation would be in, in every other database, which is way easier to update than if you had to like retrain the model, for example. Uh, and we have this example app on our website that's called Verba with a cute little golden retriever uh, logo there. And besides being a, being a very good girl, she also doesn't hallucinate. If you ask her, does VB8 make, make use of Elasticsearch, you get the, the right answer. And this is because it's a retrieval augmented generation app that has our uh, documentation in it. And, but the, the idea behind the app is that you can just put uh, in whatever you want on your data and sort of benefit from the, the same stuff. Cool, okay, so uh, now you hopefully know why or what VB8 can do for you and what problems it can solve. Now the question is, sort of, this is DockerCon, so how, how does Docker, where does Docker fit in? And for this, we need to sort of take a look at where the magic actually happens. And VV8 itself is basically only a database, but it allows you to, to do all that magic in the background. So you could send your text, image, videos, audio files, et cetera, to the database. And what you want back is the good answers, basically. But for that, we somehow need to make use of machine learning models. And this is where VV8 sort of can uh, um, use any kind of embeddings, Q&A, summarization, et cetera, models. Um, and it just sends your, your content to that model, gets it back, and um, indexes the, the vector embeddings for you. And the same then with the LLMs. So for the generative part of the search, it can also um, sort of integrate neatly with that and um, take the, the, the heavy lifting uh, off of your hands. And now you've probably guessed, every single one of those components is a container and every single one of those containers can be deployed independently and can be scaled independently. So you have very different needs, for example, for, for scaling VV8, which is the database. You're probably uh, storage bound. You would want to sort of scale this more if you have more data in it. Uh, scaling the models, they have different infrastructure requirements, so they would um, most likely make use of GPUs and these kind of things. Uh, and you would scale them if you need more throughput and, and similar for the, the large language model. Um, before we even come to the point where there's anything to scale, maybe we should also sort of talk about how do you get started with all of this, and this is another thing where it ties nicely into Docker, because if you go on our website on, on vv8.io in the documentation section, what you can see is this sort of customizing uh, option with the, the configurator that asks you all kind of questions like, do you have your own vector embeddings already? Do you want vv8 to, um, to uh, generate them for you? And if you say uh, yes or no, then basically you get get a couple of follow-up questions, and in the end, what you get out is a Docker Compose file. So that's basically the idea. VV8 is open source. Um, some of those, those third-party uh, models are open source, not all of them, so you can also integrate with, basically, with, with uh, OpenAI's uh, API or Cohere's API, but there are also a lot of open source ones that you can just run locally on your machine. So you just get the, the Docker Compose file out and do a Docker Compose up, and uh, you have a Gen AI stack, which is pretty cool, I think. Right, so once you've, you've done that part, um, ideally you can sort of build your cool prototype and can iterate fast, can figure out that, that you really do get value out of it. Um, and you can integrate it, as I said, with all these kind of, kind of tools, both uh, open source and third party. But then moving that to production is actually kind of hard because you get all kind of production challenges. So you need all the, all the parts that you need to deploy. You need to think about scaling. You need to think about security, reliability, durability, all these abilities, basically, observability. Um, the maintenance, how do you change that? And last but not least, the, the cost effectiveness, too. So AI right now, everyone is in this super excited state about everything AI, so we kind of ignore the cost, but a lot of that is actually super expensive. And um, if you want to sort of create business value in production, you need to think about the, the cost as well. And uh, this is where, where VV8's got you covered, and this slide is basically a summary of the, the uh, following slides. You can deploy it in your own infrastructure. We have all kinds of ways to reduce costs and also reduce uh, the memory requirements, which in turn basically uh, uh, reduces the amount of infrastructure that you need and therefore also reduces uh, the cost. So let's talk about how to deploy VV8. And we have three options here. Um, this starts with uh, a sort of managed offering. So this is how we, VV8, the company, make money. Um, if you don't want to operate this yourself, you can use our, our managed offering. We have a full uh, one, which is basically just a pure SaaS. So you just 
use it, use it like any other uh, SaaS service. We also have what we call a hybrid one, uh, where you can deploy it into your VPC. So if you have data that you don't want to give away, for example, and you can make sure that it stays uh, in your cloud tenant. Uh, we do have cloud marketplaces, uh, but of course also we have the open source option to just use anything of the Docker tool chain. So just talked about Docker Compose just to get started. Um, in production, we typically uh, use uh, Kubernetes or any other way that you'd like to, to run a container. Right, so let me talk a bit about cost and maybe also give, you an, give an explanation like why we need to talk about cost in the first place, why this whole vector search thing is kind of expensive. Um, what I've listed here is three very common uh, model providers, embedding model providers. The, the most common one is OpenAI, their ADA2 model. And this is 1500 dimensional. So before we talked about that super simplified supermarket example that was just a 2D map, but now think of this 2D map of having 1,500 dimensions, um, which is kind of hard to visualize and kind of hard to, to think about. Um, but anyway, every one of those dimensions is a float 32, so that's four bytes. So even just a single of those embeddings is already six kilobytes, which means a million of them is six gigabytes. And if you, if you have, um, yeah, a billion of them, that's six terabytes. So this, this kind of explodes quickly, even more so if you use the Cohere model, which now has uh, 4,000 dimensions, or 4,096, so that's already 16 gigabytes for, for a million embeddings. Uh, there is a shout out to, to Niels Reimers, he works for Cohere right now, but uh, before he did that, he uh, built open source um, sentence BERT models, so based on, the, on Google's BERT architecture. Um, they're typically only 768 dimensional, so they're kind of smaller, but still, even at that scale, it's still three gigabyte for a million or uh, three terabyte for, for a billion. So long story short, if we have that many vector embeddings and if we need to sort of keep them all in memory, we need to do something to reduce the cost. And uh, whether they need to be in memory in the first place, that's another discussion, but I only have 45 minutes in total, so um, scope that one out for here. So just for now, let's assume they do need to be in uh, memory. And then what we can do is something that's called product quantization, which the first time we heard about it, it was like, whoa, this like super fancy thing is super hard to understand. But as with many things, once you understand it, it's actually quite simple and, and quite cool. And what you do for product quantization, you start out clustering. So we're, we again have this two-dimensional space here because that's easier to understand, but this really happens in whatever dimensionality the, the vectors are. And uh, here we've created, I think, 19 or so clusters. And then you get this Voronoi diagram, which basically means that for every one of those colors, they relate to all the points that are closest to the centroid of that cell. Um, and if you do that, then basically you can assign a couple of numbers to it. Um, in reality, you would pick, so this is 19 right now because it fit nicely on the slide, but in reality, you would pick some, some sort of a round number. So for example, 256, which is exactly the options you get out of one byte. And that one byte uh, will, will play a role in a second. Now, if you were to just sort of use these 256 options and would just cluster your data into sort of one of those 256, you would kind of lose all the diversity of your data set because that would mean you could essentially index 256 things. But if you want to index a million or a billion things, you need more options. And this is sort of where the, the, the super smart part of uh, product quantization comes in. Instead of assigning your entire vector embeddings, you just assign a chunk to one of those clusters, and then you do that for, for all chunks. So in this example, we're taking uh, the first two positions, so position zero and one, and they have two specific values, so it's kind of a two-dimensional uh, um, thing right now, again. And then we assign them, we do a similarity search in the same way that we would do a similarity search in our supermarket, so it's basically just cosine distance or dot product or something like this. And then there's a definitive result for some of those segments that are closest uh, to this. And in this case, this would be randomly segment 83, and then we do this all over again. And now um, what we've achieved is actually an eight times reduction. So why eight times? First of all, because we assigned two dimensions per segment, so that's kind of already narrows the, if we had 1500 in the beginning, now we have just 750, uh, that narrowed it down. But also, instead of using a float 32, which is four bytes, we just use a single byte right now, which is our 256 options that we have. So kind of this, this continuous uh, float vector of four dimension was reduced into this two dimensional vector that is just two bytes. So an eight times reduction, which is kind of cool. 
This is a lossy compression. So because we, we kind of reduced the entire space into just the space that has these 256 clusters per, per segment, um, which means that you lose some accuracy. And what you see here is, this is kind of confusing if you've, if you've never seen this before, basically on the X axis, that's your quality and one is 100%. That's like a true, the true nearest neighbors. And um, as it drops, basically it, it's, it, get, it gets worse. So um, the different lines that you see are for different compression rates. So this is the number of uh, dimensions that we had in one segment. And you can see sort of the, the I'm not sure how, how well you can see the colors on the, on the screen here, but basically the, the line that's just at the top, that is with just one dimension per segment. So you lose almost nothing. And then sort of as you go down, you see that um, it, it gets worse and worse. So that's not very good. You, you kind of want to overcome this. And luckily, there's a relatively easy way to overcome this. And the thing is, when we look at our supermarket example again, what we did by sort of compressing the vector space is we made it kind of fuzzy. So our carrots would still be somewhere in the proto section, but maybe it's harder to now tell the carrot from the potato apart. So kind of like we'd still navigate the supermarket somewhat right. Um, but then like the final, at the final decision, um, we, we need that granularity back. And that's actually exactly what we can do as well. We can overfetch a bit. So we can rely on the fact that generally this is still pretty accurate. We just had this like tiny shift uh, in the end. And then what we can do is sort of instead of looking for our top 10 results, for example, we look for the, the uh, top 100 results, which is overfetching by a factor of 10, but looking for 100 results out of a million or out of a billion or so is still a pretty small, a fraction of it. So that still gives us pretty good results. And this is what you can see with the, with the blue and uh, red curve here. So these were both uh, taken from blog posts. This one is unfortunately sort of formatted the other way around. So now we have the, um, the X axis uh, being the quality. So, so further to the right basically is higher quality here. And then what you can see is that because that overfetching that came with some sort of a cost because now for, for overfetching we need to um, retrieve the, the ground truth, basically, from uh, our, our disk, because it's no longer in memory. And that gave us a, a small performance penalty. So if we look at 95% accuracy, for example, instead of 320 uh, queries per second or so, it's now 270. So basically, we've traded off kind of this, this accuracy problem into a performance problem, but our performance is well, only drops by 30% or so, with our memory require, uh, requirements dropping by a factor of eight. So that's a, a pretty good improvement and something that definitely sort of makes this more usable in production. Cool, one other thing um, that, I, that, that we have that I wanted to talk about is multi-tenancy. And multi-tenancy is sort of, especially in a DevOps context, can kind of have a, a slightly different meaning. But uh, what it means in the context of vector embeddings is, let's say you have an app uh, where you can just upload everything that you have on your hard drive, you can upload it to, um, to this, this, this app, and you can chat with it. So kind of like a mix of Dropbox and ChatGPT, basically. That's kind of, a, kind of a cool idea. But definitely what you don't want is that someone else can chat with your files. So here, the, the, not just the security aspect, but that whole sort of isolation aspect for a specific user base comes into play. And uh, that is basically what we mean with multi-tenancy. So multi-tenancy for those who build apps on top of VBA, they need to handle specific user groups um, as specific tenants. So if you're the vendor of that app, um, we talked about cost before. If you have only 5% of your customers active in that multi-tenancy uh, solution, you shouldn't pay for the remaining 95% of customers. And this is exactly what sort of with previous multi-tenancy solutions, um, what you would have to do, you would always have to size your infrastructure for everyone who's onboarded and not uh, for, for who's currently active. Um, and yeah, this uh, sort of all the solutions out there didn't really work. They didn't really work uh, too well. So we wanted to come up with something better, but let, let's first look at why they didn't work. And uh, for that, you need to understand sort of what those workarounds were, uh, were previously. And the first one, the most common one, was basically the filter approach. So you can do filters in vector databases in the same way that you can do uh, filters in any other system, which is kind of cool, um, but there is a cost to it. And if you do this sort of filter approach where you would say, like, select anything from the database, uh, where the database is basically, if this was uh, SQL, this would be like one giant table, 
and you say that now at query time, I wanna narrow this down to just my specific tenant ID, then basically you, you wanna match just yeah, whatever row matches that, that specific ID, uh, which in the context of SQL may be fine, um, but in the context of uh, vector search, this has a few issues. Uh, the first one is sort of, there's no isolation whatsoever, so if you wanna be GDPR compliant or SOC 2 or any of those things, uh, and you, you do require that isolation, you don't have any, because it's like one giant monolithic index, so um, that, that yeah, basically means there's nothing to, to isolate. It's also pretty inefficient. And this is uh, for two reasons. One is you have this massive graph, but you're only ever querying a tiny fraction of it, so that's kind of wasteful to have that, that big monolithic graph that spans all your users if you only ever uh, query a fraction of it. But also, um, sort of in the way that the vector search uses, that means there's a lot of data points, basically, that have to be ignored at query time. So either you lose a lot of accuracy or you lose a lot of um, speed, which, again, sort of makes this pretty inefficient. It's also super, super hard to scale this dynamically because you have a single monolithic data set. So what happens if, say, the data set grows larger than your largest machine? Basically, there's only so much vertical scaling that you can do. And of course, you can break that up into chunks using sharding so that you can do horizontal scaling on it. Um, but still, that means you're limited to some, because basically the, the cost of building such a vector index is so high. That means you're limited to whatever you could come up with um, beforehand and then you can maybe move it around. So it's not that great to, to scale either. And also, uh, this is one that's, that's maybe not the most intuitive, but it's actually my favorite one. It's very, very expensive to uh, delete something. So we had a user who launched their app. Their app was built on BB8, super cool. And they launched it on uh, Product Hunt and uh, the app went viral and they had lots of signups, which was super, super great. Um, but most of those signups were for the free trial. So that trial lasted for two weeks, and after those two weeks, a certain percentage sort of went on to, to the paid operation, but let's say 80% or so of users did not continue and they had to be removed from the system. And now if you have this giant monolithic index, um, where it's way, way, way more expensive to basically delete individual rows than it would be to just drop an entire index. Um, now, the users that didn't continue on that app basically put so much load on the system that the users that were staying and that were converting and were paying, that they were affected. And this is kind of exactly the opposite of what you want. Like, you want that, that kind of isolation to make sure that uh, this never happens. Okay, the second attempt, and this was kind of out of the two workarounds, this is definitely the better one, and this is the one that we recommended um, before we had a custom solution for, for multi-tenancy. Um, the idea was to just create one collection per tenant. So if you need that kind of, kind of isolation, then just, yeah, say one tenant is one collection. And the collection is basically like a, a table in, in SQL or, or um, basically something that, that encapsulates all your, your objects or rows. Um, what this gives you is that kind of strict isolation, which is great. So that, that means you get some of that good parts, helps you in getting compliant and all these, these kind of things. Um, you no lang longer need to set this kind of filter, so you don't have any kind of disadvantages um, for either performance or anything else that, that was um, required for the filter. What you do is basically you would just create the collection by the name of that specific tenant, and then instead of yeah, specifying the filter at runtime, you would just uh, query the collection that, that matches uh, whatever tenant it is that you're trying to query. It does solve that uh, offboarding problem, the deletion to some degree, um, because now you can just drop the entire index, which is cool, so you no longer have to sort of delete specific rows and rebuild the index or sort of uh, degrade the index over time, um, but instead you just drop it. And, there you go, and it scales kind of well, at least in, in theory, um, because what we saw is for the data points that actually scaled pretty well because you, you have these individual indexes which makes it easier to distribute them. So for example, in horizontally scaling uh, a setup, you could have so many on a specific node and so many on another node and then you could move them around. But the problem was uh, the schema the whole metadata of where what collection is because the system was never designed to have millions of collections. The idea was that you have a few collections, so that part actually didn't scale. So when it was kind of scaling, it was kind of also not scaling. Um, 
there's also lots of duplication. So if you sort of create the same collection a million times, just because uh, you, know, you want that, that sort of uh, separation under the hood, that means all the properties that are defined, all the index settings, et cetera, they are duplicated a million times. So now if you uh, want to update something, for example, that means a million updates. So um, this is also not the most convenient. And also, um, this one may be a bit specific to, to VV8, but in our case, it led to a horrible uh, mean time to recovery if something crashed. Because now you have this uh, sort of crash repair that needs to be done not once, but again a million times for a system where it was just not designed to have millions of collections uh, to, to do that. Um, but this is another one that's, that's kind of fun about it, the cost of all of this. So um, 5,000 uh, um, tenants or 5,000 collections was basically the hard limit of what we could achieve. Um, and then just stuff started crashing or started misbehaving. So that was kind of with the, with the previous work around the, the limit. Um, but not just that. Also, it took almost 30 gigabytes of memory just for managing those 5,000 collections, which is about 5.6 megabyte per shard. So if we say want to have a million of them, that would be 5.6 terabytes of of shards and they would all be empty. So that's, you, you don't have any data in your, in your database yet. You just have a very large schema and you need 5.6 terabytes of memory. That's kinda, kinda inefficient. Um, go, there we go. Um, next part was the performance. So this is <laughs> a horrible graphic. I hope you, you all agree. Um, we can see not just this, the time to add new tenants, and this was again with those 5,000, which was the most that we could get into, into that setup. Uh, it degraded over time, and then like at the 4,000 mark or so, we suddenly have these spikes where the, the P99 is all of a sudden like 10x or so of the mean. So um, not, not what you want to see, and definitely not what you want to see in production. So we were kind of at the point where we said like, hey, all these workarounds, they, they just don't scale. We need something better, we need something uh, different, and we need an actual solution for, for this multi-tenancy problem. And for this, we set out with a couple of design goals, and we said like, okay, we really need to have millions of tenants in a single cluster. Um, we need to have that strict separation. So for GDPR, for SOC 2, for ISO, all, all these things. We want to have linear scalability, so this super important one. How do you know how many users you will have three months from now? Super hard to predict. So ideally, you should, you should uh, size your infrastructure for the load that you currently have, and if it's more in three months, you just throw infrastructure at it. You just add more nodes to the cluster, and so very important to have that linear scalability. And we want, come on, clicker. Uh, there we go. Um, you also want uh, the resource isolation especially in the, in the offboarding case before, so we talked about before sort of the trial uh, that ended and people weren't, um, weren't converting to paid users. Um, and then the other part is um, that we talked about in the, in the beginning, you don't wanna pay for someone who's inactive, so you basically don't wanna pay for idle infrastructure. And what we did is we sort of built exactly that. We made sure that uh, we kind of used the best parts of the previous infrastructure where uh, in the, in the um, situation where we had one collection per tenant, we would use the shard under the hood. We wanted to do the same thing, but now we had to make those shards super lightweight. So um, same thing basically, and all of a sudden um, our 5,000 shards took up only 870 megabytes, which is just 174 kilobytes per shard which then with this sort of uh, North Star goal of a million tenants would bring us to 174 gigabytes, which is still a, a fairly large number, but this is, also, this is also a million different collections. So if you have a thousand objects in, in each of these uh, tenants, that would already be a billion objects, and if you have a million in each, that would be a trillion. So this is kind of very, very large scale, where then again, I think it's, it's kind of okay to, to have to use 174 gigabytes uh, especially compared to all the other resource, resource costs that are involved with uh, AI apps. This one looks much, much better, I hope. So I scaled it exactly uh, the same as the previous one, so you can, you can see the comparison. Not just is it a flat line, it's way lower, and also we got rid of those peaks. So basically it's kind of, yeah, if you build a system that's supposed to be good at something, then it, it, try, it, it tends to be good at um, what it's made for. So instead of the workaround, the purpose-built solution uh, has greater performance, which was really cool. Uh, this is one of our uh, Grafana dashboards of one of the automated load tests that we run on every release ever since we, we had the, the feature. And in this one, this is probably very hard to, to see the, the numbers there. Um, 
But in the, the bottom graphs, you can see that we're scaling this to 120,000 tenants, so we're no longer restricted to uh, the 5,000. Um, and then uh, this is with 120 million objects, so just 1,000 per, per uh, tenant. And the important thing again here, everything is linear. So this doesn't stop at 120,000 tenants. This was just what this particular cluster was uh, sized for. And if you would size it larger or add more nodes to the cluster, then um, yeah, it scales to whatever way you want. So again, we have that linear scalability, which is super cool. Um, same for, for querying. So um, this is uh, querying through 3,000 tenants with a total of 16,000 queries per second at what I think is a pretty reasonable latency of uh, 36 or so milliseconds, all queries succeeding, so all is fine, and this is, this is great. And we're running this for, for every release now as part of our test suite, which um, sort of makes sure that, um, yeah, we, this also doesn't degrade over time. One other thing that you could do, so I talked before a bit about um, sort of uh, memory being heavily used in, in all AI apps and especially in, in vector databases. And um, looking at the sort of different costs of different storage tiers, there's memory, which is fast, but it's, it's expensive. There are SSD drives, which are sort of somewhere in between, and then you have cloud storage, which is super cheap, but, but super slow. And uh, one thing that you can do and this is sort of where we're talking about active and inactive tenants. Since we now have that resource isolation and every single tenant is basically its own self-contained unit, we can also turn them on and off individually. And that's a super, super simple concept but with a super big payoff because that means if 20% are active, we can deactivate the other 80% and that means we just don't have to pay for them, don't have to size for them. And because this is all way more dynamic now, it's also easier to just basically deactivate it, schedule it on a new node and these kind of things so you get this, this uh, kind of dynamic uh, aspects of, of scaling it. And um, for sort of the average size of tenants that we saw, it is only a few hundred milliseconds to activate them. So you could kind of tie this to a login event, for example. If a user logs into an app and um, they entered their password or something, that's plenty of time to send a signal back to Vivi and say like, hey, heat up this particular tenant, load them into, into memory that they're ready to go. And um, then you can sort of, yeah, rely on the fact that if they're, if they're not active, you don't have to uh, have any kind of resources for them. Okay, that was my, my intro to VV8, sort of with a couple of deep, deep dives in specific sections um, to, to sort of quickly recap. Any kind of gen AI stack right now probably uses a vector database, either sort of uh, as, as part of their, their immediate stack or because they're using a tool that in turn uses a vector database. So for example, the, the retrieve log meta generation example that's used to overcome the, the hallucination problem. Um, we, we love Docker, um, so the whole sort of idea of, of um, yeah, using the Docker Compose that you can compose on our website and, and get started, super easy to, to just run it and, um, and yeah, try it out. Production is hard, but vg has got you covered, so cost reduction was one of the parts that I focused on about a lot. There's deployment, there's security, sort of all these, these things to, um, for us it's, it's because it's such a new field of course, we want to excite people about it. We want to make sure that people get started, but at the same time, we really want to make sure that for those that move to production, that they have all that they need for, for that as well. And finally, yeah, there's lots of cool stuff that I give you a bit sort of an insight into VV8. We have the tenant isolation stuff. We have the compression algorithms, and there's, there's plenty more uh, that didn't fit that talk. Um, yeah, that's, that's VV8 for you. If you want to connect with us, um, we have that's that's our website, um, GitHub repository. As I mentioned, it's open source, so it's just vv8 slash vv8. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn, um, and you can follow me on on X. Still sounds kind of weird to say that, so that's Twitter for you. You can follow me on X at hndi or vv8 underscore io. Thank you. If you have any other questions or any questions, I'm still here now. <laughs>